Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Ledford, and I'm an assistant professor at Georgia State University. And today I will be talking about beaver dam analogs in an urban stream. Lessons learned from one form-based restoration project. This is work that I've done in collaboration with Elizabeth Suddeth at Georgia Gwinnett College, Glenn Barron and Spencer Peck at the city of Atlanta, and Ty Smith at Hazen and Sawyer, along with the Blue Heron Nature Preserve, the location of our restoration project. So the Blue Heron Nature Preserve is located in North Buckhead, um, about eight miles from downtown Atlanta. This is an area of land that was purchased by the city in the year 2000 and is currently operated and maintained by the on-site nonprofit group, the Blue Heron Nature Preserve. Overall, the preserve is about 30 acres that runs along Mill Creek and then along portions of Nancy Creek and Nancy Creek itself then uh, discharges into the Chattahoochee River. It has ecological communities consisting of woodlands, floodplain or riverine, and meadow habitats. And it is highly used by neighbors uh, in the area. So it has formal woodland trails and boardwalks, formal birding spaces, and a lot of environmental outreach and education activities, including STEM day cares, and day camps, and biological research. The portion that we're going to be focusing on for our restoration is along Mill Creek and it drains about 1.3 square miles of approximately 30% impervious surface cover area. Although we have a strong guess that that is actually higher because we're draining Phipps Plaza and part of Linux. Um, it is incised, channelized, and has very high incoming sediment loads, and it is extremely flashy. We have estimated there's almost no upstream attenuation of flow, and we uh, think that the 100 year flow could be as high as 1,000 cubic feet per second, despite the small watershed area. The project is going to take place, or did take place, at around 8.7 acres or around 1,300 linear feet of Mill Creek, which makes up about 30% of the preserve's area. And it focused on uh, stream wetland restoration for water quality and habitat enhancement. This is in part because Nancy Creek is a 303D and 305B impaired stream for both fecal and biota. So targeting this area for restoration first came up in the 2016 Nancy Creek Watershed Improvement Plan, um, and then was also part of the 2018 Nancy Creek Consolidated Watershed Based Plan. The original proposals had been that we would use natural channel design for restoration along this reach, but as you'll see, uh, a less invasive technique was chosen. So looking through time, records indicate that the site operated as a grist mill in the 1920s, but by the 1930s, as you can see on the left, uh, while the mill state still may have been operating, it was clear that there is some urban encroachment with roads being put through the area. There is continued rapid urban expansion up through and to even today um, through the 1990s. In the 1990s, the dam, however, was breached, which drained the grist mill pond. Um, and um, then at one point, the stream was illegally moved, channelized and incised um, to get us to the point where we are today, um, where we have um, a, a large floodplain where the mill, use, mill pond used to be, but an extremely incised and channelized stream through the system. What's interesting though, is that beaver lived at the site as recently as five years ago. And so if you were not aware, beaver have been and are making an urban comeback in the Southeastern United States with large number of beaver ponds being found in uh, not only Atlanta, but also Charlotte and Raleigh-Durham. Uh, the beaver in this area seem to travel up and down Nancy Creek, living on the tributaries until they eat themselves out of home, in which case they move on to a new site while the vegetation regrows in one of their old sites. This is unsurprising because the natural habitat um, of beaver consists of almost all of the entirety of the contiguous 48 states. And we're currently estimated across the US that populations are about 40 million for beaver, down from a high of 400 million prior to beaver trapping taking over. So our goal is gonna be to see if um, the hydrology that beaver have, which you're gonna see um, fits with our context of restoration can be recreated. So the goal was to implement 8.7 acres of wetland restoration via beaver dam analogs. So human built attempts to create and mimic the function of beaver dams. 
The goal is to increase uh, water quality by uh, sediment accumulation and storage in the area and increase groundwater recharge, which would help reduce urban sediment pollution to Nancy Creek. And uh, we want to enhance riparian and aquatic habitat from the stage where we already are. So instead of setting it back to a blank slate, which you may after natural channel design, why can't we start ecological uplift from where we already are on day one of the installed project? Uh, the hope is also we can increase flood attenuation throughout through, through floodplain reconnection because we have this large area that we can flood with water. Um, and this will hopefully then decrease downstream impacts. And then reduce immediate site impacts during construction. Uh, it became clear from stakeholder feedback and coordination that natural channel design was not a desirable methodology due to the typical disturbance use uh, and use of heavy machinery and the anticipated high construction fee. So instead, let's think about what beaver do to our landscape and if we can mimic it. So we need to start by remembering that streams are active evolving systems that should exist in a dynamic equilibrium and steady state may actually be inconsistent with how ecological systems actually work. So instead, um, we're gonna talk about um, the theory behind this 2013 Clure and Thorne paper. So they represent or come up with this idea of a stage zero reset where in time, the geomorphology resets itself as land use, hydrology, and biology change over time. So stage zero, this point in the future, can be likened to a system with a complex braided habitat, well-connected floodplains, elevated groundwater tables, and expanded aquarian, aquatic riparian and avian habitat. And our goal is to go from the present of ch incised channel to complex braided habitat through a process-based design, uh, process-based technique. This also fits in well with Ellen Wool's idea of, river, of rivers as beads and strings. So um, her uh, proposal is that before humans settled in um, across the United States and other places, uh, river habitat actually existed as comp large braided habitat complexes that were then connected by smaller reaches of classic meandering stream. But what we did as humans was go in and drain a lot of that system and remove many of those ponds and wetland habitats. So a great example of this might be a stream flowing through the middle of a farmer's field. That farmer's field may used to have been a pond or a wetland complex that was drained to instead grow crops, um, but the stream still exists through it. And so maybe we can use um, process-based restoration to put those wetland complexes, put those complex hydrologic pieces of the, of the beads of the system back where we can to move us towards a new, um, a new hydrology. This would be beneficial to both humans and the environment. So we want to see if we can do it. So our fundamental approach was no different than any other stream or wetland restoration project. Uh, we followed key steps and they included doing base mapping. We needed to figure out the site considerations and des design constraints, such as subsurface or above ground infrastructure, FFEs and such. We did a historical aerial review. So what plan forms has the stream experienced already and does it align with our base mapping of soils? So you saw how we've seen how that system uh, has evolved from the 1920s and on. We did field investigation and characteriza characterization to field truth critical areas for preservation, um, identify uh, ideal channel features for structure placement and more. We have done remote monitoring, uh, pre and post construction to quantify impacts uh, and hopefully quantify uplift of the whole system. Um, the, uh, end, the, the end approach that we did looked a lot like this with a distribution of BDAs and PALs at uh, key points along the stream. Um, and then we also had to go through permitting agency coordination for construction permitting. Um, and then the field engineering uh, during the construction phase to ensure that everything was done properly. So beaver dam analogs um, have mostly been used out west where they um, are used to increase water storage to provide additional drought, wildfire and rangeland resilience. 
Um, as of right now, we are this lone dot in the Southeast, but it is our hope that uh, this might be a technique that people realize can be used in a lot of locations. Um, as far as we're aware, this project is the largest urban stage zero uh, restoration project in the country. But of course, that is not to say that this type of approach could or should be implemented everywhere. Careful considerations have to be made in the evaluation and design process to determine suitability, especially in the urban context. So uh, our, this work was funded by a 319H grant from the EPD uh, and uh, also matching funds from watershed management. Um, and an annual contractor was used for installation, which we'll see in the next slide. We've also um, done a lot of in-kind donations. Um, we have uh, time and research coming from folks like myself and Elizabeth, who um, have been doing monitoring at the site. And then we've had a lot of work from volunteers to collect uh, material for the BDAs and to do willow plantings. Overall, we estimate that the approach um, of that this approach costs one order of magnitude less than a full natural channel design restoration approach would. So the, the cost impact is much, much lower. All right, so how do you install a BDA? Well, first you install vertical post material via pneumatic driver, as you can see uh, in the video on the right. After those um, uh, sections have been installed, you weave and pack material to a desired crest elevation. You then plug upstream base and mud uh, with mud and substrate to try and prevent leaks. You need to start thinking like a beaver. And then you just repeat, you repeat all of these steps in sort of six inch to 12 inch sections to achieve the desired crest elevation. You install downstream scour mattresses and you pack again. So as you guys are gonna see, this packing is clearly a key important part of this work. And so these installations went in in March and April of this year, and we've been monitoring them since. We've had clear successes. So this is uh, BDA five before installation. It is a place where we had done um, numerous years ago, a volunteer BDA installation, which did not have the pneumatic driver which was very key. And so um, you can see some of the remnants in the foreground of the picture. So we took uh, some of those remnants and added more material and have had a very clear success with a large pond forming behind the system. We're getting good sediment accumulation above the pond um, and the channel downstream um, is also starting to have more um, complex morphology. We have also learned a lot of success of lessons. Um, you really have to make sure each layer is properly woven, packed, and plugged. Um, when they're not um, it, packed or tied to the bank properly, um, you can have end cut. Um, during one of our, um, after initial installation, we've had the crew come out and do lots of maintenance. Um, one of those times in the picture at the bottom, you can see we uh, start to try and reinforce this. But once again, they're not getting properly tied to the bank, and so that's causing some end cutting. Um, and so this is happening when uh, material is unwoven or unpacked, isn't being uh, supplemented with enough mud and other material. And so the water starts to cut the channel around the BDA. Um, sometimes even our attempts to shore up in cuts are washing out. Um, although it's really important to note here, and you can see it in this picture on the right, there is a secondary channel um, that we are eroding towards. So distinct possibility that this system is actually just trying to reach its new dynamic equilibrium and reconnect with a channel that already existed. So uh, it's really important to note that in the philosophy of uh, stage zero, this is not a failure. This is the system doing what it's supposed to be to try and find its new dynamic equilibrium. Um, and we are continuously working to stabilize the channel at these sites. We also learned that um, holes anywhere can lead to undermining posts and dam failure. Um, so on the left is a picture of poorly packed subbases at posts. And on the right is one example of structure failure. Um, we've seen this um, most e expressively at our most upstream BDA, um, where's a picture on the left from September and how it currently looks in February on the right. Um, and so you can see once those posts start to give out, they tend to get washed out pretty quickly. 
the, um, the engineering approach that needs to be done here is that we have to do more mounding with a gradual increase in elevation so that we can try and limit uh, undercut forces to reduce holes and reduce that post failure potential. This is probably even more important in an urban stream with our flashy hydrology than it would be in a Western typical stream where these have quite historically been used. And so as you can see, ongoing maintenance is really necessary. Uh, think like a beaver. Um, so um, we have to be consistently out removing trash. Um, we need to maintain a desired height. If you come out after a storm and you see that the system has adjusted, you may need to come in with more branches and more mud to um, fix and correct any damage as it happens. With one of the really big end goals of the system, especially when you consider our willow plantings, to try and attract the beaver back to the system. Maybe if we do a little bit of the work for them, uh, uh, they might come back and keep doing the work for us because they are a lot cheaper than contractors. So what I wanna leave you with is that um, there are two common mistakes in the use of BDAs. Um, we don't wanna focus on the individual structure design. The idea is to create a total habitat. Um, and um, this is gonna mean putting a lot of different tech uh, pieces in and not worrying too much about if an individual uh, BDA is perfect or not. Um, we also um, don't want to focus on overbuilding BDAs to try and make them too stable. So like I was mentioning, the places where we're getting end cuts, um, that is the system trying to reach dynamic equilibrium, reach a new better equilibrium and fits well within the idea of, of, of a successful stage zero approach. Because once those channels reconnect, we've also then increased the flooding starting to create a complex braided system, which was our end goal. And so, um, you know, you need to think about the floodplain as a whole instead of each individual BDA when considering this type of technique. So research and monitoring is ongoing to see how these continue with time, but that's where we are right now. I'd like to end this by thanking all of the partners for the project, um, especially the Blue Heron Nature Preserve for working with us to uh, try what we are, or what we believe is the largest urban stage zero restoration approach uh, ever tried. Thank you all.